And with that, I'm excited to start our program this afternoon by welcoming alumna Rachel Tom Thompson, who will walk us through the science behind mindfulness and share ways that we can apply it to our lives. Thank you, Rachel, for joining us, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Karen. It's such a pleasure to be here with you all today. My name is Rachel Thompson. I'm a body mind coach and a UIC alumna, and I am just so excited to be here with you all today. So just to lay some of the groundwork of what we're going to be covering today, my intention is to in introduce this topic so that you have more clarity around what mindfulness and the mind-body connection are, get familiar with some of the science behind it, and walk away with some tools for you to start engaging it in your own life starting today. I just ask that during this presentation, keep an open mind and bring whatever questions you have at the, um, for the end of the presentation, because we'll have some time for some Q&A. And more, most importantly, remain curious and have fun, because we're going to cover a lot of great stuff today. So before we dive in, I have a question for you. I would love to know how familiar you are with mindfulness and the mind-body connection right now. That's on a scale of one to five. And you could just go ahead and um, submit your answers below. Wherever it pops up. <laughs> okay, so while you're answering this, I think a great place to start is, why is mindfulness and the mind-body connection important? Well, using mindfulness and the mind-body connection in your life can help you reframe your relationship to stress and pain and help you make better choices more often so that you experience more of what you really want to and less of what you don't. And who doesn't want that, right? I mean, it sounds too good to be true, perhaps, but it is entirely possible. And what's even better is that you already have everything you need right now to make it happen. On a personal level, what I'm, going to, what I'm about to share with you completely changed my life. It actually is what pursued me to, what inspired me to pursue my career about 10 years ago in wellness. And I found that the more I learn about the principles I'm gonna be sharing with you today, the better I've understood my relationship to myself, my body, my life, and I'm here to help you do the same. And the best part is, is that this is free. This is a mindfulness and um, the mind-body connection are free and it's available to us all. And this is where it starts. So I was introduced to mindfulness in my body connection in 2010 when I was studying massage therapy. It was integral in my work as a massage therapist and in my education, and it showed me just how incredible the body is, how incredible the human body is, and with that, how powerful and resilient and brilliant we as humans are designed to be and are, and I just had to know more. I'm, I'm a lifelong learner. I had to know more, right? So naturally, that led me to pursue kinesiology here at UIC, and all of this laid the foundation for my work today as a body-mind coach. So to understand the significance of mindfulness and the mind-body connection, there are two things you need to know, and that's first, that the body has an innate intelligence, and it's designed to heal itself, and it will, given the right conditions. And the second piece is that the body is constantly telling us what's going on and what it needs from us to heal. Now, healing really applies to anything that we as humans experience. This is stress, physical pain, and emotional pain. And the conditions really just mean whatever the body needs to restore balance to itself, or what's called homeostasis. Now, the reason we mention balance here is because balance is a very necessary function of the body because it's how the body regulates itself. It's like a gauge that allows the body to detect when something is wrong or off so we can fix it. And we could talk about this all day, but let's just suffice it to say that balance is more of a fluid state. So it's constantly changing and the body has to constantly adjust. So it uses homeostasis to do that. And this is a process that happens all day, every day. And it's what allows us to heal ourselves. Now, when we think about the body using balance to heal itself, we have to understand that our behavior and our decisions have a role in this process. What I mean is there are things we can do that help expedite this process of the body's ability to heal and to feel good, but there are also things we can do that slow it down. The body is incredibly resilient, but we should do our best to take care of it. And a great way to do that is to appreciate how our decisions affect our health and well-being. Now, the good news is that the body is always telling us what it needs, but we have to learn its language in order to understand what it's saying. This is where mindfulness and the mind-body connection come in. So what is the mind-body connection, right? Well, it's really our relationship to, our to ourselves and our life in general, and it's made of one part the mind and another part the body. We'll explore both sides of this equation more in detail in just a bit, but for now, just know that this relationship between the mind and the body is what allows us to experience life. So it's pretty important. 
the promise of the body mind connection is that we can influence our physical health and well being using mindfulness. In other words, by being aware of what's going on in our bodies and in our lives, we can directly influence how we feel and what we're experiencing. Mindfulness is what allows us to do that. And another word for mindfulness is awareness. Awareness is like a flashlight. If you shine a light on, if you shine a light on your life, you can see what's happening and give yourself the opportunity to do something about it. See, when we're aware of what's going on, we have the upper hand because we can see what's happening and we can choose to do something about it. But when we're unaware, we can't because we're in the dark. Awareness is powerful because it can transform our lives if we let it. So naturally, we'd want to know, how do I increase my awareness, right? Well, the best way is to educate ourselves, much like you are now. If we want better answers, we have to ask better questions. Stay curious about yourself and your life, and you will be sure to receive the answers you seek. Now, in a nutshell, we can shift our experience of life and ourselves by understanding that there's more going on than what meets the eye. And more importantly, there's something you can do about it just by being aware of it. So now that we've covered that portion, I am curious, in your opinion, do you believe that the mind creates physical sensations in the body? In other words, does the mind influence the body? Okay. And while you're answering that, let's talk about why we need the mind-body connection, right? If the body knows what it needs to heal and it's designed to heal, why would we need something like the mind-body connection, right? Well, the main reason is disconnection. So let's talk about it. Where does disconnection come from? What is it? Well, the best way to answer this is just pause for a moment and think about your life. Think about where you're at, what you have to do, you know, every day, every week. There's a lot going on, right? We have careers, we have families, responsibilities. And then on top of that, there's a 24 hour news cycle, there's social media. We're stimulated every waking moment. And with so much demand for our attention, it's easy to get distracted. It's easy to become disconnected from our bodies. Now, if we're not careful, the busyness of life and subsequent distractions can easily create disconnection. That's why we need mindfulness and the mind-body connection so that we can reconnect. The mind-body connection is something we all have access to, but the problem is that not everyone, and really most people, aren't aware of it. And that's why I'm here, that's why you're here. You deserve to know about it. This is all something we should be aware of. Now, with that said, the reason this isn't common knowledge isn't one person's fault, it's, and it's certainly not your fault if, you, you know, if that applies to you. It's really more of a reflection of how our society evolved. And we'll get to that in just a moment, but unfortunately, as a result of this lack of awareness, it's created an epidemic of disconnection and it's causing a lot of problems. Truthfully, if we lived this way automatically, we wouldn't need to call it mindfulness or the mind-body connection. We would just call it living. And this is the sincere opportunity we have here because we get to use this awareness to change if we want. So speaking of connection, how connected would you say you feel right now? One would be very, one is disconnected, five is being very, dis, uh, very connected. Um, and while you're answering, we can talk about the importance of connection. So um, imagine for a moment that the body is like a big company with many departments. Much like a big company, the body needs an efficient communication system in order to manage its resources and ensure its overall function. If you've worked in a big corporation or if you've worked on a team, you know what I'm talking about because communication is essential, right? So in this way, we can think of communication, connection as good communication and disconnection as poor communication. The better the, the better the communication, the better the system operates. The poorer the communication, the worse it operates. And the same is true for the body. So how do we know when we're disconnected? Well, the two major symptoms of disconnection are stress and pain. We touched briefly on the epidemic of disconnection, as my brilliant mentor, Laura Wick, has called it. So to give a numerical value of what this epidemic looks like in America, check this out. This connection is expensive. It costs, so chronic stress in America costs up to $300 billion every single year. 
chronic pain costs over double that, or $635 billion. That's a total of almost $1 trillion spent every year managing these, these stress and pain. And this isn't a joke, right? Everybody, you know, everybody has experienced stress and pain at some points in their life, and it can be really dis disabling if, it, if it's prolonged. And this is why it's, it's of the utmost importance for us to be aware of, of what we can do ourselves to help, to help these processes, um, to help us heal, right? So again, why are we so disconnected? How did we get here, right? Well, really it's how society evolved. Disconnection is inherent in society. And a main reason for it is because it's how we learn, right? So it's not, it's not entirely terrible, <laughs> but it, it is how we learn. We learn through a reductionistic um, style of learning where we break things down into its smallest parts so that we can understand it, right? Well, the, you know, that works in, in, um, when we're learning a topic. Like for instance, I remember when I was in anatomy and physiology, we learned about the body by breaking it down into its separate parts, right? Muscles, bones, we did, you know, cardi um, the circulation system and, and things like that, right? But in nature, the body is one unit. They, they are all working together all the time and they need each other to work, right? So it's, um, it's just important to note that in nature, it is one unit, it's one thing, everything works together, right? So the second reason is that Western medicine is really just now embracing the validity of mindfulness and the mind-body connection. And part of that is because the research is just now starting to come out. There wasn't really space for mindfulness and the mind-body connection in the Western paradigm up until now. And that's great for us, for you and me, and for everyone in America and in the world, really, because we can use this information, this insight in conjunction with Western medical practices and have a wonderful holistic healthcare experience. Now, I want to say also here that disconnection is also something that the body uses to keep us from experiencing anything harmful. It's a defense mechanism. So when the brain perceives something as a threat, it uses disconnection sometimes to protect us. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. So now that we've seen how stress and pain are symptoms of disconnection and, and the effects that it's having on our country. Um, so let's talk about how we can shift our relationship to them. Because believe it or not, stress and pain are actually not designed to hurt us. They're here to help us. That's because stress and pain are messages from the body designed to tell us when we're disconnected or when something's wrong and it needs our attention so that we can do something about it, right? So this is where awareness comes in. Now, if we start to think of these sensations as messages from the body, we can better understand what's happening in our bodies, shift our relationship to stress and pain, and make better decisions so that they don't control our lives. So we have a better idea of what disconnection is and how it shows up in our lives. So let's talk about connection. When the mind and the body are connected, communication is efficient. This means that all systems are talking to each other as they should, everything is functioning well, and any problems that come up can be troubleshooted easily. This efficient communication translates into good health, a robust immunity, high energy, clarity of mind, and all of that makes us feel really good. So as we know, the mind-body connection is like a relationship with ourselves and our lives. It's one part mind, which is thought of as the non-corporeal aspect of our experience or the non-physical aspect of our experience. And the other part is the body, which is the physical aspect of our experience. And this is what neurobiologist Dr. Candace Pert called the subconscious mind. Actually, she wrote a book on it called Your Body is Your Subconscious Mind, where she explains her decades of research around her revolutionary study of neuropeptides. It's worth noting that she was an amazing um, researcher at, the, at NIH, which is the National Institutes of Health here in the States. And she was the first person to propose joining the words mind and body to capture the relationship that she was observing in her research. And she was the first person to join the studies of psychology, neurology, endocrinology, and immunology for the first time. 
and or what she liked to call psychoimmunoneuroendocrinology or mind-body medicine, right? <laughs> so thanks to Dr. Candice Burt, we have um, this amazing research and um, information at our disposal. So as you can see, the mind and the body are really connected, like really, really connected. And this is what Dr. Perr has to say about it. Her research has provided scientific evidence that a bio biochemical basis for awareness and consciousness exists, that the mind and the body are indeed one, and that our emotions and feelings are the bridge that links the two. She goes on to say, in the beginning of my work, I matter-of-factly presented that emotions were in the head or the brain. Now I would say that they're really in the body as well. They are expressed in the body and are part of the body. I can no longer make a distinction between the body and the mind. It's pretty incredible. It, it's it just, yes. I mean, she said it better. She, nobody could have said it better than her. So as we can see, both aspects of the conscious and the subconscious, the mind and the body must work together for us to experience life fully. And to understand a little more about how this works, we, have, we can look at the body's physiology, which is how the body speaks. Take a sip of water. <laughs> okay, so communication in the body happens in what's called the central nervous system. Basically how this works is the body uses feedback loops to receive, process, and send information about what we're experiencing so that we can navigate life. The brain is like the command center of the body. It's like a computer and its job is basically to process information from the body and send out directions in response to what the body is saying. The body, on the other hand, is designed to feel. It has proprioceptors in the skin, in our muscles, tendons, and organs that help us detect and collect excuse me, information about our internal and external environment. If the brain is the computer, the body is what carries out its programming. So we know there's a brain in our heads, right? But did you know that there's a second brain in the body? There is, and it is called the enteric, enteric nervous system, which is a division of the central nervous system located right above the perineum in the pelvic bowl in what we call the gut. So we know the brain is incredibly important to our function. And one of, the one of the reasons for that is its role in hormone secretion. The brain in the head produces 50% of dopamine and 5% of serotonin in our bodies. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter or another messenger that plays a role in controlling our movements as well as our emotional responses. Serotonin is another messenger that naturally stabilizes mood, regulates anxiety, and helps with sleep and digestion, right? So we, we need these, we use them, they're great. But where does the rest come from? It comes from the brain in our gut. It comes from the enteric nervous system. This is important because we tend to view the body as functioning from the top down and that the brain and the head controls everything when actually 80 to 90% of all information received by the central nervous system comes it comes through the body up through the enteric nervous system to the brain. And you may have heard me refer to myself as a body mind coach. And this is why, because most of our information is processed in the body first. It's pretty cool. So left to its own vices, the body will run whatever program the brain gives it. So knowing this, if something's not working or if we want to improve our lives in some way, we can feed the brain a new program and open ourselves to possibilities, new possibilities. So how do we do that? Luckily, it's not as complicated as it may sound. <laughs> so how do we reprogram the brain? Well, like any new skill, we learn and improve through repetition. So repetition strengthens what's called a neural pathway in the brain. And these neural pathways are really just patterns that, the, that help the brain and the body communicate more efficiently. Over time, with repetition, the new pathway becomes stronger and the task becomes easier to do. This is how we create new habits, new behaviors, and really new ways of being. So if it were that easy, everyone would do it, right? So why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to change? Well, the reason for that is the brain is wonderful, but it is wired for safety, not success. And what that means is Safety is really anything that has been experienced before, while success is something that typically requires us to do something we've never done before. And the brain, since its job is to look out for threats and to keep us safe, it's constantly on the lookout because our, 
our safety and our survival depends on it. Now, this is also a defense mechanism because the brain activates the body's alarm system, aka the stress response, when it feels threatened, except it hasn't gotten an upgrade. So the same response used to save us from the saber-toothed tigers is the same response that's <laughs> activated when you think about your email inbox over the weekend. Pretty scary, right? <laughs> so this is how it works, okay? In short, feelings are the language of the body. They are important survival messages passed between the body and the brain through the central nervous system. And this process happens almost instantaneously every moment of every day. So an example of these messages that we receive is thirst. This is a pretty direct message from the body sent up to the brain to let us know what we need to drink water. As you can imagine, if we didn't get the memo or if we weren't able to meet those needs, we wouldn't survive. So it's important. <laughs> but these aren't the only messages that the body used to communicate with us. Our, these messages also include our emotions. And again, when the brain and the body communicate efficiently, we're better able to respond, avoid danger, and survive. And I have a quote here that explains a little bit about this. Chemicals called neuropeptides have a connection with specific receptors in the body, like a key and a lock. Receptors exist for all emotions, as well as for body reactions like appetite, sexual behavior, and water balance. And this is from Dr. John Sarno of the Mind Body Prescription, which I would highly recommend you, you check this out if this is interesting to you and you want to learn more. Um, so we can talk about this all day, but I think a great, this would be a great opportunity to see this working in real time. So let's try it out. So let's just get comfortable in your seats and maybe shake it out if you need to. Um, and just bring to mind something that makes you feel happy or maybe something you love or someone you love and just kind of hold that thought in your mind for a moment. Notice what's happening in your body as you're thinking about this thing that you love or that makes you happy. It may be a subtle difference, but there is a shift. And that's your body responding to your emotion just by thinking about it. So how does this work? Dr. Daniel Goldman is the author of Emotional Intelligence. And he explains that when the body experiences an emotion, it takes six seconds for the feeling to be felt throughout the entire body. This is our physiology at work. This is the, those messages being um, sent and transmitted throughout the body. Now, left to its own devices, the body will only take 90 seconds to feel the emotion, to process it, and then release it. This is a very natural function of the body. This is something it's designed to do. The only thing that stops this process from happening is the choice that we make. And Dr. Goldman says that this choice is really more like a judgment. What I mean is when we judge how we feel, when we attach meaning to what we feel, which often relates to a reflection of our character or our worth as a human being, we're saying that we're only allowed to feel certain things. We're only allowed to feel this or that, and that restricts us. And restriction is a form of tension, a form of physical tension. So think about, has there ever been a time when you've wanted to say something and you didn't, or you felt like you couldn't, and you kind of like tightened up and like maybe your throat kind of closed up? That is this process at work. Well, much like the theme for our talk today, we're often not even aware that we're making these judgments. A lot of these are subconsciously made. And when we're not aware of how harmful these judgments can be, we, when we're not aware of how harmful these judgments can be, we're unaware of how we're inadvertently hurting ourselves or stifling this process that our body naturally wants to, wants to do. And these judgments, I just wanna say, you know, they come from things we've experienced from a very early age. And a lot of these are things, messages that we've learned through our society, through our home lives, from 
we, we receive these messages from a very early age and they influence how we perceive ourselves, how we perceive the world and, and how we fit in that relationship. So I say this because when we judge how we feel and we stop the process, that also sounds the alarm in our body and it triggers the stress response. And as a result, we create resistance. And over time, resistance creates tension in the body. Unchecked tension contributes to pain. Pain results in dysfunction, illness, and so many disorders we unfortunately know very well. Um, so how does this work or why does this work? Well, the process of physical and emotional pain are the same. What, it, what that means is that physical pain and emotional pain have the same neural signatures, which means that the same areas of the brain fire when we experience physical pain or emotional pain. Dr. Darno, Dr. Sarno says, mind-body symptoms exist to serve a purpose. If you thought of that purpose by taking away the symptom without dealing with its cause, its true cause, the brain will simply find a substitute symptom or disorder. And Dr. Pert says that chemicals, that the chemicals running our body and our brain are the same chemicals that are involved in emotion. And that says to me, we better pay more attention to our emotions in respect to health. So with that said, let's talk about the role of our decisions and um, our choices. And here's a poll. <laughs> So on a scale of one to five, how easy is it for you to make decisions? And while you're answering that, let's talk about why decisions are so difficult to make sometimes. Why is it so hard to change? <laughs> well, change, like we talked about, change usually means that we have to do something new. And as you recall, new equals unfamiliar, which the brain perceives as a threat. And in response to the threat, it triggers the stress response and creates resistance. It's resistance that makes it really difficult to change. But it's not just doing something new that's stressful, right? Add in the fact that we now know that, that physical and emotional pain create, they manifest the same way. And when we resist what we feel, all that creates resistance and it's, it just compounds, 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 right? This all leads to pain and stress and dysfunction in the body. But we also now know that these are all ways that the body is communicating with us. These are ways that the body is just trying desperately to get the message across to us to tell us what's going on and what we can do about it. But when we don't hear it, the brain will create other solutions and the cycle continues. Hence the big $1 trillion healthcare bill we saw earlier in the, in the presentation. This is why stress and pain are so out of control in this country. But now we know better, you know better. We're here and we're all in this together. So. This ties into our decisions because in every decision we have a choice. In every moment we have a choice. We always have a choice. It's never too late to make your life work for you and you can start right now. So the choice that you make ultimately gives you the opportunity to be successful in whatever way you define success, but we have to first choose it. But we choose our definition of success and that could look like, I wanna live with less stress. I wanna live with stress, less pain right? Um, when we choose our definition of success, we're choosing what we want to experience. And now that we know that mind and body exist so that we can experience life and they have to work together, we can use them to work for us. And we do that by making decisions. So what goes into decisions, right? We have this slide up here. Well, since the time you woke up today, you've made dozens and dozens of decisions. Those decisions are made based on our thoughts, which are based on our beliefs, which are based on our feelings. And that's all based on our experience up until now. Like we talked about, some of, the, some of these decisions are made consciously or we put thought into, but there's a lot we don't simply because we don't need to. We've had practice. We know, you know we have routines, right? These are all neural patterns that our brain forms to help us do what we need to without um, expending too much energy, right? Well, for even those seemingly reasonable and rational decisions, research shows that only the, the conscious mind only contributes 5% of our decision making. So where does the other 95% come from? It comes from the subconscious, AKA the body, AKA how we feel. So you can see how all of this is starting to tie together. So naturally we'd wanna know, how do we make better decisions more often? 
And the best way to do that is to get body mind connected. We reconnect the mind and the body using mindfulness. So let's try it. We're going to do a body scan and you can use this to get connected anytime you want. We'll only spend a couple minutes here, but you can take this and spend more time with it if you'd like. Okay, so we're just gonna settle into our seats again, get really comfortable, and if your feet aren't already on the ground, I would invite you to lower them. Okay, we're just gonna start by taking a nice deep breath in through the nose and out through the mouth. The body only takes, it only needs three breaths in and out to activate the relaxation response. So just a little tidbit for you. Okay, so we're gonna start by bringing our attention and our awareness to where our feet are meeting the floor beneath us. A nice way to do this is to imagine there's like an outline of your feet on the ground. Just bring your attention there. And just notice, notice how it feels. Now, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna draw this awareness up through your body like medicine in a syringe, okay? So with each breath, you're gonna imagine that your awareness is traveling up through your legs and to your ankles, up into your shins and your calves, just breathing into those spaces there. And you can just notice where there is openness and space and where there is tension. Just invite the tension to soften with your awareness. Breathing still, creating space with each breath, moving up through the knees and into the thighs, on all sides of the thighs from back sides. Just notice what's there. Draw your awareness up further yet into your hips, into your abdomen, your stomach, your back, your low back. Further yet, pulling the awareness through your chest, your shoulders, out through your arms, into your elbows, into your wrists, your fingers, all the spaces. Now draw your awareness up further into your neck, all sides of the neck, and draw that awareness now into your head. Just notice what's there. Invite any tension you might feel to soften. Now imagine that there is a string connecting the bottoms of your feet all the way through your legs, your hips, your torso, your arms, all coming together until they meet one in one focal point at the very top of your head. Just imagine there's a little string at the top of your head and you can feel it pull and as you do, the spine lengthens and the body just falls into a very natural, neutral position. Just noticing. Now we're gonna seal this awareness that you have just found and created in your body with one final breath in. And we're gonna release it with a breath out. When you're ready, you can flutter your eyes open. Come back. Okay. I have another poll for you. <laughs> How connected do you feel now, now that we've done a little embodiment exercise? Hmm. So we covered a lot today. So we're just gonna do a little recap. What you need to know is that life is a felt experience. The mind and the body are designed to work together 
and we need them to experience life fully. Using mindfulness and the mind-body connection, we can make our lives work for us and experience more of what we want to and less of what we don't. The ways to do this are just to listen to your body. It is always communicating you, with you and it wants you to feel good. And it's always telling you what it needs to do that. The second piece is that you do already have everything you need to experience anything you want. And awareness is your most powerful ally. Stay curious, ask better questions of yourself and your life and let your body guide you. And my final words for you. There's a saying that half the battle is just showing up much like you did here today. You could have been anywhere yet you chose to be here. I want to honor that decision because there is a reason for it. And I hope you are receiving what you needed to hear today. Now, if throughout our time together, you've thought about a dream you've had or the things or the times that you've wished for things to be different, I implore you to take some of what you learned today and choose again. It's never too late. If something doesn't feel good or something isn't working, there's a reason for it. And it's not because there's something wrong with you or that you deserve it. It's, it's quite the opposite. These are all messages from the body telling you it's time to change. And if it is time to change in a small way or in a big way, deciding is the hardest part. From there, all you have to do is show up. And there's a reason it's easier said than done, like we talked about. Getting through the resistance is difficult, and that is why support is so important. The right support will help you weather the storm and hold you accountable to your vision when the going gets tough. And this is what I help my clients do. I help ambitious optimists use their body-mind connection to get clear on what you want for your life and what you want to experience, and then create a plan to make it happen so that you can get out of limbo and move towards that vision with confidence. I do this because I believe in you. You can achieve anything you want. You just might not know it yet. And with a clear vision of what you want to experience, a plan to make it happen, and the support you need to see it through to the end, anything is possible. So if that's you and you're ready to make those big or little changes and you would like to work together, your next step is to book a free connection call with me today. I'll leave the link up here for you along with my contact info. Feel free to reach out with any questions at all. Thank you so much for joining me. It has been a sincere honor. And now we'll open the floor up for questions. So thank you, Rachel. Now I feel like I have to um, some this because I'm relaxed. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, Really appreciate your presentation and lots of good information and tips. Uh, let me uh, turn it over to ask some of our questions. We had a few that came in beforehand. Perfect. Uh, so let me start with, since mindfulness is being studied in so many areas, could you give us some direction in keeping up the latest research, whether that's a website, a blog, a newsletter, authors? I know you mentioned a few um, uh, uh, authors there, but... Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so some great resources would be um, definitely check out those authors I mentioned, um, Dr. Candace Pert. You can find a lot of research, um, a lot of her research online. Um, and she, you know, there's the book, Your Body is Your Subconscious Mind. That's a great resource. And then I have another book by Dr. John Sarno, which is called The Mind-Body Prescription. And this is all about the ways that um, phys like emotional pain manifests as physical disorders and there's dozens in here. It's phenomenal. Um, but as far as, you know, other resources, the Dr. Deepak Chopra is a really great resource too. Um, and he has a Chopra center. Um, yeah. Um, and I'd, I'd be happy to, you know, um, also be a res resource, however feels good. Um, if you have any questions about that. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and I should have said before, but again, I'm relaxed, so I'm not on my game, um, that our participants should feel free to put questions in the, the chat room and we will try and get to as many as possible. Uh, next question that we got was, can mindfulness help you recover from trauma? Yes, it can. It certainly can. Um, I will say that it's important to seek out a qualified healthcare provider to assist you through this trauma. Their trauma, um, it's different for different people and um, the ways in which the trauma is inflicted is different, right? So you want to seek out a qualified healthcare professional to assist you in coping with that trauma in the way that you need to. 
and you can use mindfulness and the mind-body connection and all the principles that we talked about today to complement that work. I just want to stress the importance of that. that um, so you got the help that you need. Okay. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, do the things you see and hear affect you physically? Yes. Yes. Those are all messages um, to the body that our brain takes and interprets and um, it attaches meaning to it, right? So that's, and it's really just a way for us to say, okay, this is safe. I can proceed in this direction or it's not. And I'm going to avoid that, right? Um, so yes, every, things that we see in here do affect us um, and influence our mind-body. Interesting, because even subconsciously, because you'll be, obviously we're receiving information all the time and not necessarily thinking about it. Exactly. And that's a really good point because like you said, the body is receiving information all the time. I mean, when we go to sleep, the body doesn't stop working, you know, it's, um, so it is constantly per um, perceiving things for us and it uses that information, stores it in our subconscious mind so that we can become aware of it at a later point when we need to. So it's pretty, um, pretty cool. <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, okay, so with so many demands on our time, do you have any tips of how to carve out time for mindfulness every day? And then I'm going to add on to the question, and how much time? If you, if you carve out time, how much what is ideal? Ideal pl starting place, right? Yeah. 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 Um, so the best way, or what I've, I'll, I'll share what I've found helpful. Um, in the morning, um, if you can maybe carve out like five or 10 minutes before, like maybe if you have a cup of coffee in the morning, like just five to 10 minutes, just sitting there and you can do the body scan like we just did, right? And just, just at, you know, just bring attention to your body. What's going on? Hey, what's up? <laughs> um, and just, just having that time to re reflect and connect with yourself. If the morning is too busy, I understand. Um, I'm more of a night person myself too. So I, um, would recommend maybe adding that five or 10 minutes at the end of the day, maybe before you wind down, right? Or even as you're winding down, um, just spend a few minutes to um, reflect, you know, maybe on the day or just how you're feeling. And um, I really like to journal. Journal is a really therapeutic reflection process. Um, and I actually have a journal um, template I could share um, that's helped me kind of reflect um but yeah i just you know the the best way to include this in your life is just to find what works for you it doesn't have to be you know the same time every day that's a great habit to form but when you're just starting out just um fit it in wherever um you have a few moments or just a few breaths um and even just breathing like taking those three breaths to connect your body and relax yourself is a, is a really wonderful place to start. So, um, you want to, we're in this for the long haul, right? So don't yeah. know. Yeah. It, it's a, uh, I think we, when we get so busy, it's easy to forget how just the power of breathing really can help you just refocus and recenter even when you're in our crazy lives. Um, do you, do you mind, uh, Rachel, just typing back in the recommended books that you had? Um, and, that, and, and I will uh, ask you another question while we're, while we're doing that. Uh, we have a few questions about which are those, those books. And I want to make sure that our participants uh, get them. I did see a question about would we share the slides? And this is being recorded and the slides will be shared um, along with the recording afterwards at the UAC Alumni Exchange website in about 10 days. So uh, yes, just you'll have to be a little patient with us as we're preparing them on the back end. Uh, okay, so next question. Uh, do you think that mindfulness and the mind-body connection can assist with chronic pain? Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Like we talked about, these, you know, chronic um, pain and stress, right, are patterns that are formed in the body, in the brain. Um, and when they aren't, um, let's see, when they're reinforced over time, that's when we start to see chronic, um, chronic, chronic pain and chronic stress, right? So um, using mindfulness and awareness, you can start to notice, okay, my chronic pain, my stress is showing up in these ways, right? And um, use that awareness to shift maybe some part of that and um, 
and start to release the stress and pain pattern cycle because on its own, it'll just continue to feed itself because the brain and the body like to operate on autopilot because it's, it's more efficient. It's efficient for us to do that. Right. Um, so it's really a matter of breaking the cycle and it starts with awareness. So even just by being aware that, Hey, I have this pain, I've had it for over six months, right? That's, you know, six months and longer is, is um, technically chronic pain. Um, and, um, just being aware of that and saying, okay, what can I do about this now? Right. And, and then again, you want to work with a qualified medical professional, right. Um, to assist you in that process and use this in conjunction with that to help break those patterns. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's in chronic pain. I'm sure that anything that, that would possibly help would be. Um, yes. yes. Um, Somebody is asking if you can share the journal, journal template. I don't know if that's something yeah. that you're able to share or not. Um, yeah. A question about that. Yeah. Uh, okay. The next question, uh, can this help those with fibromyalgia? Um, and then it says that there's a few, the person has a few uh, clients that feel a lot of pain. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, in this book, um, healing the body, healing the pain, the mind body prescription, which I just, I just popped in here. He does talk about, um, fibromyalgia and the role of, um, you know, the subconscious influence on the physical pain. Um, that is a great place to start. Um, and I would just recommend, um, some of those, like some of the exercises that we did today, like the body scan, that's a great, great tool. Again, breathing, um, and just noticing what's showing up, like what, um, um, yeah, how does the pain show up? When does it show up? What does it feel like? And, um, start to notice those patterns, um, and bring your, use your awareness to shift those patterns. This isn't a question from our audience, but I'm just going to throw it in there because you now have me curious is, um, uh, I, with mindfulness, has there been certain research that's been done on, um, like fibromyalgia on certain uh, chronic conditions? Is there more, I'm not asking a question clearly because I'm not reading it. Um, is it, are there are certain diseases or chronic conditions that has been, mindfulness has been shown to be more successful in that there's been more research around it or is it across the board? So um, it's been really helpful for, um, I mean, most stress and pain related um, pathologies or dis disorders, you could say. Um, again, the research is really just starting to come out um, about the full scale of these things um, and the influence of, you know, the mind-body connection on these things. Um, I would say for definitely for things like anxiety, it's mm. mindfulness and the mind body connection is very helpful for, um, and, um, what else? Yeah. I mean, um, honestly, you know, Dr. Sarno in this book says that even just by being aware that the link, that there is a link between your emotional pain and your physical pain can actually shine a light of awareness on that thing and release the pain. Mm. So even just acknowledging the relationship is, is healing, right? So um, mm -hmm. that's what I, yeah, that's, that's what I would offer at this time. Yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, a couple more questions. Um, do you have any nutrition related recommendations to optimize your gut health for stress and pain reduction? Yes. Um, so again, you want to seek out a qualified medical professional for the right path for you. But what has worked for me is um, something called L-glutamine, which is a um, it's wonderful for gut health. It helps heal the lining of the gut so that we don't have leaky gut and things like that, that, um, disrupt our homeostasis. Um, another one is magnesium, magnesium, um, glycinate, I believe is the, the formula. Um, but that's really great for, I mean, magnesium is considered like the master mineral in the body and it's essential for relaxation and for healing. In the body. So um, what I use is called Calm, C-A-L-M, and you can find it at any, um, pretty much any um, drugstore. But again, you know, want to make sure you're getting what you need to. So consult your, your doctor, your nutritionist for that. Oh, I actually have some examples here. 
this is calm. This is what it looks like. And it's like a powder. You just mix it in with your water. That um, that and then L-glutamine. And then this last one is called ion gut. So yeah, these are things that I, I use and that have worked really well for me, so. Great. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, can you rewire yourself to change your physical reactions to stressors? Yes. Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And any particular tips or? So I would suggest, um, so whatever the stressor is, notice, I mean, you're probably aware of what you are feeling when you're experiencing it, right? But just um, become hyper aware of what's going on when you experience that stressor and um, um, the next question you want to ask yourself is how do you want to, how do you want to feel when you encounter the stressor or any stressor right that it may seem like what does that mean like how do you want to feel well if you feel a stressor and it's um, impacting you in a negative way how would you rather you felt when you experienced that stressor right um, so it's, it's kind of like taking that that question helps dial down the um, in, like um, the intensity of this this response that you're feeling, um, and repeating that um, repeating it over time will reinforce that new pattern of behavior. You know, because this is these are just learned behaviors, right? That yeah. um, that we develop. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think we have time for one last question. Um, and the person is asking if you can quickly reshare the steps for a body scan as they'd okay. like to work with their teams. Oh, you bet, yeah. Um, okay, so the first step is just to find a nice comfortable position in your, you know, if you, you could do this seated or lying down, but I'm guessing on a team, you're probably gonna be doing it seated. Um, so the next step would be just starting to bring your awareness down to the bottoms of your feet and just notice how they feel against the floor. And then from there, um, that you can kind of think of that as like the anchor. And next you'll um, draw your awareness up through your legs, you know, through your ankles, through your knees, up through your thighs, and just continue to draw the awareness up, 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 you know, out to your arms, to your neck, and out the top of your head. And if it's helpful to feel the connection between your, um, of the whole body. You can imagine that there's a little string at the top of your head. And um, at the end, it should feel like, you know, just like little something, um, like awareness or like, um, there's like a little fuzzy or something like that. Like um, you should feel that throughout your whole body and you can seal it, seal this awareness with a breath, like we just did, and then out, and then that's it. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's a perfect way to end. This is Rachel. This has been so helpful and such a wonderful presentation and conversation. Thank you so much for your time and and for this today. Um, I can tell just without even reading the chat, there's lots of great discussion going on. Um, so we very much appreciate your presentation. Uh, so uh, just real quick, so please join us um, again for our next upcoming alumni exchange program, which will be on Tuesday, June 23rd. Um, featuring another UIC alumna, Liz Herrera, who will walk us through an interactive discussion as she presents job search strategies during COVID-19. You can find more information at go.uic.edu backslash alumni exchange. And of course, please be on the lookout for that quick survey. Thank you again, Rachel. We very much appreciate the session and your time today. We're very proud of you as a graduate of UIC. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again and seeing everybody else again in the alumni exchange. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. You too.